than to be in your presence. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Holy Spirit. Thank you for coming down and just coming along with us, Father God, and, and bringing the blessings of heaven itself. God, let us never forget why we're here this morning. Let us never forget that it's all about you. Now, Father, you take the worship, you receive it, Father, from our mouths. But now, God, you take your word. And, God, you instill it in our hearts. And let our hearts be turned to you this morning. And we ask it in your holy and precious name. And the church said, amen and amen. About three weeks ago, I was riding somewhere, and I had the radio on, and there was a preacher preaching a sermon, and I got listening to it because I'd never heard it put that way before. Then about two weeks ago, this same subject got brought to me again, and then the other day, Miss Kathy called, she said, you want to put something together to put in the newsletter? And I said, sure. And uh, so we did that. Then she called back and said, how about a scripture? And then the same scripture came up again. And so may not be the smartest guy in the world, but after a while you figure out God's trying to tell you something. And so I got studying this. And God showed me some things that I had not seen before in this particular verse of Scripture. But, uh, you know, sometimes I'm going to use a, a little bit different illustration this morning because it's one that I, I really love. We get thrown a curveball. And some of you ladies are looking at me, what do you mean by that? I used to love to play baseball. See, back uh, when I was growing up, you didn't have all the little video games and all that. Mama would give you breakfast and she'd scoot you outside and you went and played until it was time to come in and get something for lunch. And then you went out and played until it was dark or she called you home. The one thing you did was stay close enough that you could hear Mama yell for you to come home. So we always entertained ourselves playing ball, this and that. And, and I got to love of baseball, and I played it a lot of years. And my last year I played, I was 16 years old in what they call Bronco League back then. I loved to hit a ball. Had a real good coach who taught me some things. And through his instructions and all, I was privileged to win the Calhoun County batting champion that year but in doing that I had to learn how to hit a curveball and a lot of people say well a curveball is an illusion I caught for two or three years as a hind catcher and I can assure you a curveball is not an illusion it curves I love the balls that come straight down the plate because you could lay into them but I had to learn as that ball curved, you kind of leaned over, and when you hit, it was a little different than hitting that hard ball. But if a pitcher realized you couldn't hit a curveball, guess what you were going to get when you were batting? A steady diet of curveballs. As we walk through this world today, we're going to get some curveballs, and we have to learn how to handle them. We have to learn how to take and adjust ourselves to hit that curveball. He said, how in the world are you going to get a sermon out of that? Well, this morning, 
As we look over in Joel, if you have your word with you this morning, if not, they'll have it up here. The main scripture we're going to look at this morning is Joel chapter 2, verse 25. And the title this morning is, Allow God to Restore What You Lost. I wonder if up in heaven there's a big old lost and found. Have you ever been at, usually every church I've been at, there's a lost and found. People leave things in the pews. It gets put into a box. And then you wait for somebody to come claim it. God has a lot of things for us if we don't claim them. Sometimes we get lost, but sometimes we claim them and then we lose them again. So I'm asking you this morning to allow God to restore what you may have lost. In Joel 2 and 25, it says, And I, the Lord, and this what I'm going to read this morning may be a little different than what's up there because I never looked back up there. And I, the Lord, will restore to you the years that the locust hath eaten, the canker worm and the caterpillar and the palmer worm, my great army which I sent among you. We like to claim the promise of getting back what we've lost. We like to claim this verse, the promise is given here, and come into an agreement with God of restoring the years that were ravaged and we had things taken away from us. I think we may feel like the year 2020 took a good bit away. The year 2020 seen a lot of changes. But here for a little while, I want to focus a little bit more on the four insects that are mentioned in this scripture. Each one represents a type of locust at a different stage of development. There's the lava, the young locust, a non-winged locust and a winged, a winged locust. Now, from what you've probably heard, locusts swarm quickly and mercilessly, and and they breed rapidly because they only live for a few months. And when they come through a place, they devour what's there. They take away the green, which represents life, which represents living. And they travel great distances in doing this. Kind of like when we allow sin to germinate, it explodes out of control and eats away our very existence, consuming our blessings along the way. When we talk about here traveling great distances, I'm going to hit upon a different theme this morning of generational curses. And some of you are looking at me real funny right now saying, how can there be generational curses? I'm going to give you an illustration. Generational curses spring from sin. Now the world has taken, and you've heard me say this quite a few times, and I believe we need to keep pounding on the issue until we realize what it is, the world has taken sin and put a new name on it and tried to shove it down Christian's throat saying this is acceptable. And I'm going to hit on one briefly here this morning as an example, homosexuality. You take a couple who are homosexuals who take and adopt a child and bring it into that family, what is that child going to get taught? You are starting to look at generational curses as one generation takes and passes sin to another generation and says it's acceptable. That person is raised up in that sin, and guess what? It keeps getting passed down and passed down as being acceptable. You say, that's kind of a stretch. Let's look over in Exodus chapter 20, verses 4 and 6. 
it gives us a warning. Thou shalt not make unto thee any graven image or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or that is in the earth beneath or that is in the water under the earth. Thou shalt not bow down thyself to them nor serve them. For I, the Lord thy God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers up unto the children, unto the third and fourth generation of them that hate me and showing mercy unto thousands of them that love me and keep my commandments. Life is in the last part of this verse. It tells us how to break these generational curses, and we'll get back to that in a little bit. But we need to remember that God's intent has always been to redeem man, not to condemn man. Now, let's look at something here for just a minute. Whenever these locusts came in Scripture here, and for our purposes this morning, we're going to let the locusts represent sin. It represents a progression of sin and how not addressing it at the beginning stages because of looking the other way false rationalizationing, justifying, or condoning causes it to manifest quickly, spiring out of control, and opens doors of destruction, destructions in our lives and for generations to come. On our TV, I don't know how many channels we got, but there's nothing to watch. You know what I'm talking about. What used to be a form of entertainment which was good has turned in to a communication device for sin. My wife was devastated a few weeks ago. She loves the Hallmark Channel, and homosexuality has come to the Hallmark Channel. I'm sorry, but I do not like to see two individuals of the same sex kissing and loving on each other. It is sin. The Bible says it is. And I'm just using this as one example of sin this morning. But we have come to the place to where we just look the other way. Because it may offend someone if we say something about it. It's time the church gets back to a state of holiness and believe in God's Word and believe what it says and quit going along with what the world says is okay. In Joel 1 and 4, it says this, That which the polymer worm hath left hath the locust eaten, and that which the locust hath left hath the canker worm eaten, and that which the canker worm hath left hath the caterpillar eaten. See, it doesn't end with the polymer worm, but rather begins again with the locust. It's a cycle. And let me tell you what happens. One form of the locust will come in and eat the green leaves off a plant. The next locust will take and eat the tender green part of the stem down to get to the hard part of the stem. The next locust will come in and eat the hard part of the stem down to the earth. And then the last one comes in and eats the roots. See, what sin does, it comes in as it gets the tender parts of our heart, it takes away the blessings. And then as that next one of the, of the representation of the sin comes in and gets the tender part of the stem, it takes away our joy. And then as it eats that part of the stem down to the earth, it gets our hope. And then when the root gets devastated and gone, 
all hope is gone. See, as the individual takes and if sin is not taken care of in their lives, their joy gets gone because their joy is being replaced by the things of the world. The blessings leave because God is not going to bless an individual who is not walking upright and with him. And then we start getting into the state of depression and other things to the point to where hope starts leaving us. And as that hope leaves us, it gets to the point to where sin is taking over an individual's life to the point to where death comes. And I'm not talking about physical death. I'm talking about spiritual death. And then as those individuals pass this on to those around them, it starts spreading and goes from generation to generation because that's what generation teaches another generation. See, I used to think as, as the Bible talked about generational curses, boy, that's the thing of the Old Testament, but it's evident today. We see it today. My granddaughter who works for DHR. It's unbelievable some of the things you hear about. Do you know that they have people that monitor the computers of students in school? And you know who some of the worst ones are in school? It's not your high school students. It's the elementary kids and what they talk about. I've got first-hand information on some of this. Where do you think they hear all this? There is so much now over social media that is acceptable that parents are letting it into their homes, either aware or unaware, and it's being put into our children's minds and into their hearts, and it's taking and it's changing generations today to a point to where there's going to be no hope. Not very popular what I'm preaching this morning, is it? How about it? What's been eating at you here lately? Have you had a harvest lately? Have you been waiting with an expectation of what God's going to do for you? Are you at the point to where I'm not sure there's any hope left? It's time for the church and for God's people to take action. It's time for us to choose not to tolerate any sin or any of its forms, choose to be more sensitive to God's Holy Spirit and, when, and what He shows us and convicts you concerning sin in your life and your family's life. You would be surprised on how many phone calls I've had, how many people have come up and talked to me about all the prophecy going on right now. And, of course, I look at prophecy as, if it comes true, it's prophecy. If it's not, it's man's opinion. But this I can tell you with a promise. We're living in the end times. Jesus Christ is fixing to come back. He's fixing to bust the sky wide open. He's fixing to call his church out of here. And then all hell is fixing to break loose. And a world that wants to tolerate sin is going to get their stomach full of it because the Antichrist will come into control. 
But we have people walking around today that are blaming God for the things that are happening when it's not God. We're living in a world that has been consuming by sin, that is taking and letting sin take it over to the point to where sin is an acceptable thing in people's lives today. Oh me or oh my, because I'm going to tell you the church is the only hope through Jesus Christ that the world has. And when people look at the church and they don't see any difference than the people walking out in the world, wake up, something's wrong. I told God this morning, I said, this is not going to be a popular sermon, God. Because I had to eat it before y'all got it. I had to realize that there are some things I'm not doing for God that I'm supposed to be doing. There are some things that I've been letting slip that I don't need to let slide anymore. If God's church is going to make it through these end times, and I'm not talking about the times after Jesus comes, I'm talking about the times we're living in now before his coming because the church is going to be under persecution. Christians are going to be under persecution because we will not conform to the world. We want to stand at a different standard which God has set forth, and doing that, we're going to be condemned. Are you willing to be in that group? Are you willing to be the one that people point their finger at? There's a weirdo over there. Something I've noticed in the construction industry, there can be a lot of stuff going on, and people don't know you, and this occurred this last week when I had some guys out there who's not on our crew, and they were talking some things, and I just looked over and I invited them to church. The whole atmosphere changed. They didn't have a comeback for it. They didn't have a joke for it. They didn't know what to say because it was out of their realm. It was out of their world. As Christians, we need to be quick and heartfelt to repent of the sin if it comes into our lives. We do not need to open any doors or cause any spreads, any seeds to be spawned. We need to continue to fight a good fight and allow our Holy Father to restore us. For God has already given us the victory. God has already given us a promise. A promise that everything that has been stolen will be restored. Christ will restore everything the enemy stole. Life can deliver some bad blows to us. Life can deliver some blows that are life changing that, that looks like that we will have no recovery from when it affects our family and those around us. But when life throws us a curveball, we don't have to accept it. I learned as I was playing baseball that more than likely that pitcher wasn't going to throw every ball a curveball, so I would wait for the fastball. That's the one I liked. Life's going to throw us some curves, but life's also going to give us some good things. It's time as Christians, we quit dwelling on the bad things of 2020 and come out of it with the things that God's given us and look forward to what he's going to restore sevenfold because the Bible says when an individual stole something from someone there, it was restored seven times over. Listen to me this morning. It's coming and it's going to come in a great abundance. Are you ready? Are you ready for what God's going to give you back? 
Are you willing to walk the walk and talk the talk in order to get it restored to you? Hard sermon this morning, but one I think we need to hear because it's only going to get worse before it gets better. Well, aren't you Mr. Doom and Gloom this morning? I've read God's Word. I've read what's coming. If you haven't been following us on Wednesday nights and Revelations, we're right in the middle of who the Antichrist is. His number, 666. And only those that take his number on the forehead or the hand can buy and sell during those times. Well, Pastor, it can't get any worse. Oh, yes. I'm going to tell you something this morning. Hell is worse. God has given us a promise of heaven, but hell is just as much here as heaven is. And man has to make a decision. And woman and child has to make a decision of who they're going to accept. If we are to experience this supernatural restoration, we must have faith that it will happen. O King David, I was reading this morning in Psalms, and one of the things that was said was, how can you believe Psalms by its author, David, who wrote a lot of it, who was a murderer, an adulterer, and went on to list several other characteristics of him. But he was a man after God's own heart. Even when Samuel came to anoint him, he overlooked him. But God doesn't overlook you this morning. God looks and he sees a person who he is ready to restore. He is ready to take, give back everything that has been taken away. He is ready to give you a victory and a promise that he says that he is coming back. And when he comes back, we're going to go and be with him. Are you ready? Are you ready this morning for what God has in store? It's time to break the curse. It's time that parents take seriously how the kids are raised. It's time that grandparents who are having to take on the role of parents now take seriously how their grandchildren are raised. I think one of the greatest things we possess is family. I was privileged yesterday to have most of our family at the house. I have learned if you feed them, they will come. And I fed them lunch yesterday, I fed them supper, and had them back for breakfast this morning. And then my granddaughter had the audacity to say, we ought to do this every Saturday. I love it. Because my grandkids still come in and curl up on the couch just like they're at home. My kids come in and curl up on the couch and take a nap just like they're at home. And you know what? God wants us to be his kids. God wants us to come in and be so comfortable. We curl up on his couch and take a nap. He wants us to be so comfortable that we say, hey, God, can we come and eat with you again? God, can we come in and sit at your table again? God says, yeah, I'm waiting on you. I'm waiting on you to come. So as we close this morning, I want to ask you something. How important is your family? Is your family important enough? And I'm going to get particular now. Dads, or ever who's the head of the house, is your family important enough for you to make the right decisions? Is it important enough 
that you make the decisions that's for the best interest of the family and not for the popularity of being a parent. I had a lady in my first pastorate came up to me and says, I'm having trouble with my two girls. She's a single parent. She said, I want you to take their telephones away from them. I'm not their parent. I got her and the two girls in my office. I had a talk with them. I took their phone from them and gave them to the mama. Then I let the girls go and I looked at the mama and I said, it's time you quit being a buddy and start being a parent. It's time parents start being parents and stop being a buddy to their children. It's time that children learn what no is because no is just as anointed as yes. See, we're living in a world today where yes is all that's acceptable because it might hurt your feelings if I say no. I'm going to tell you something right now. You get so far and deep in sin that you can't come back out of it, God's going to say no. He's fed up with it. He's tired of it. And it's time the church come to an understanding of we're going to have to get to a state of holiness that is acceptable to God that we can walk in and be his servants. Hard sermon this morning. But unless you can show me in Scripture where it's not the truth, I believe it's the truth. God loves you today. I'm not going to leave you out there in nowhere land. God loves you so much he sent his son Jesus Christ to die for you. See in that verse over here, it said this. After it talks about the locusts, and in Exodus it talks about the idols. And then the scripture says, I will restore. And let me just throw this in there. Someone here said, I don't have an idol in my house. Something I didn't realize I was studying this. We're not to make any image of God whatsoever because man in his creativity cannot imagine how God is, who God is, so therefore we cannot make an image of him that is worthy of him. Have you ever thought of that? Our little pea brains can't do it. It's hard for me to imagine someone who can be everywhere. Someone who is so powerful he can take care of everything. Someone who is so perfect he lived a life here and never sinned. But yet, every promise he makes he keeps. See, I learned at a, at a very young age of being a parent that if you say maybe, that means it's a promise. Well, we might can. That means you're supposed to do it. But when God says it, it's a promise. And when Jesus came and died on the cross, he made a promise that anyone who would believe in him and accept him as Lord and Savior would spend an eternity with him. Because Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no man come unto the Father except through me. Not through being a good person, not through being a moral person, not through being a righteous person, but through Jesus Christ and accepting him as Lord and Savior of the shed blood he put upon a cross. So this morning, we're going to stand as Michael plays. And I'm going to ask you this. What's your commitment for the year 2021? What kind of commitment do you want to give God today? First of all, I had to ask God as I was going through this, forgive me of anything 
that I've done, I've been doing, that will cause a block between me and you, between my fellowship with you. I don't want it. I want a true fellowship with you, God. I want one where your spirit flows from your throne unto me. That when I read your word, it lights up. That when I read your word, it just jumps off the page and I see things I haven't seen before. See, that's what happens when you got a fellowship. And if there's anything stopping the flow of that fellowship, you don't get it. In order for the church to function the way God wants it to, there has to be a clear fellowship between him and us. So how about it this morning? Would you come and dedicate yourself to God this year? Because I believe this is going to be a changing year. I believe this is going to be a year that we see God's church come forth in a mighty way. That's going to touch individuals. They don't even know yet they're going to need to be touched. That the church is going to be in the forefront of a revival that's coming. That's going to change the lives of people. That don't even know they need changing yet. because they're living in a place of sin where they can't see who God is. But God is fixing to take the scales off their eyes and reveal his son Jesus Christ to them and let them see what they can have. So how about it this morning, church? Would you dedicate yourself this year to doing what God wants done? Would you dedicate just yourself to you and him? I'm not asking you to do it to me. I'm asking you to do this between you and him. That when he asks you, you're going to respond with a positive yes. That when he says, will you walk a life that's going to be worthy to raise your kids up in, you'll say yes. Will you shun sin and call sin what it is? Will you live to a higher standard than the standard the world has set forth? Is it going to be easy? No. But I know who's walking with you. I know who's walking before you, and I know who's walking behind you. So as Michael plays this morning, these altars are open for any reason. Would you come this morning? Jesus Christ. 
praise you, Father. church, if you will, Debbie Adams had requested that her niece Brittany needs prayer. She'd went to the ER in a diabetic coma. She's better now, but she still needs the church's prayers. Please, please pray for her. Randy and Deborah are getting over the coronavirus. They're doing better, but please pray for them. Seems like everywhere I turn, I get a report that someone's in the hospital or they've got the virus or there's a new strain coming out. It's time the church spends time on its knees. If you don't have anything else to pray for, you pray for me. I had the privilege of becoming your pastor in March, and the virus hit. It's been an up and down all year long. But I look to the ups instead of the downs, Brother Johnny. You've got a board here that's men that are strong in their spiritual walk that's had to make some hard decisions this year, past year. It's not easy when you say we can't have church. It's not easy when you have to tell someone, well, we can't do that because we can't gather that close together. It's hard when one of those kids come up and wants to hug you and you can't hug them. But church is just about over with. Because I know what's coming. I'm fixing to get to pull up to the table with my Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And I'm going to get to sup with him. And I hear people say, I'm going to ask Peter this and Peter that. I just want to set in the glory and honor of my Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. I'm not going to be concerned about any of the rest of it. Taking a here to God's promises, church. Walk in a way that God can look down and say, that's mine. We're walking through some places like Jeremy mentioned this morning when Peter walked out there on that sea. It's time we quit looking at the waves coming. It's time we keep our eyes on Jesus. Because the waves ain't, ain't even going to be noticeable. But I tell you this, my Jesus is able to reach down and pull me up if I do. 
He'll reach down every time. He's not going to let me drown. Father, we just lift you up this morning, God. I thank you for your son, Jesus Christ, who died on the cross for me. I thank you for your Holy Spirit who comes and dwells among us, gives us comfort and gives us peace and gives us guidance. I thank you that you are a God of promise and that promise is fixing to come true because you're fixing to send your son Jesus to step out on the clouds. Call your people home and take us out of this world, God, that is in such turmoil. But God, I want to carry everyone with me I can carry, God. I want to be your witness. I want to go forth in this mission field you put us in, God. And I want to let them know who you are. God, you make us a strong church. You make us a church, God, that's willing to go out and not be ashamed of who you are, God, and you'll not be ashamed of who we are. Now, God, I thank you. I thank you for your word, even though sometimes it's hard, God. It's meant to give us an encouragement to let us know that you're still there. Now, Father, as we go forth, you guide and direct every step we take, every move we make, every word we speak, and let us speak forth life unto everyone that we meet, Father God, sharing your Son, Jesus Christ. Now, God, thank you for your love and thank you for the peace that you give us in times of trouble. And I thank you that you always walk with us. As we go forth from here, God, put a hedge of protection around your church. Put a hedge of protection around us, God, as we walk out into a world that has so many perils in it. But God, as we go forth, may we go with the assurance of who you are, what you've promised, and what you're going to do. And we ask all this in the holy and precious name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And the church said... Amen and amen. Do not forget.